Let us pray. And Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Joshua 3, 5 Father, you have delivered me out of this sin-filled world and set me apart as your own. I am your child. You have consecrated me and set me apart to do good works that will glorify your name in the earth. You have washed me clean in the waters of baptism. The blood of your precious Son, Jesus, cleansed me from my sins and put white robes of righteousness on me. I am a new creature in Christ. You are a holy God, and without sanctifying myself, I cannot draw near to you and enter into the intimacy you desire to have with me. Cleanse my heart, Lord, and renew a right spirit within me. Sanctify my thoughts, attitudes, and actions as I humble myself before you. As I separate myself from this world and focus on you and your kingdom principles, I feel myself being prepared for a greater revelation of your power. As I align myself with your word, I can trust you to reveal your wondrous ways to me. As I draw near to you, you will draw near to me, and I will see you move on my behalf in a miraculous way. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening to today's daily prayer. For more inspiration and an incredible message from our feature pastor, stay tuned to Pray.com's Sunday Service. Welcome to Pray.com's Sunday Service, sponsored by Altrua HealthShare. Follow this podcast and listen weekly to receive godly wisdom and practical advice for daily living. Stay tuned for Sunday Service, coming up after a quick word from our sponsors. There's an innovative, better way to find health care. We're Altrua HealthShare, an affordable and flexible way to take care of your family. We're a community of like-minded, health-conscious individuals who share in each other's medical needs. And you can customize your health care your way with Altrua HealthShare. You can build your membership based on your season of life and your family's needs. Head to myshare.org to find out more. That's myshare.org. Altrua HealthShare, where we care for one another. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. What are some things that you want to keep the same about yourself or your life in 2024? Where are you already crushing it? Think opposite of New Year, New You. Around New Year's, we get obsessed with how to change ourselves instead of just expanding on what we're already doing right. Maybe you finally organized one part of your space and you want to tackle another. Or maybe you're taking supplements every morning and now you want to actually eat breakfast too. Therapy helps you find your strengths so that you can ditch the extreme resolutions and make changes that really stick. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Celebrate the progress you've made. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Sunday Service today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Sunday Service. Hello, this is Matt Potter from Pray.com, and I want to tell you about this new juice cleanse I've tried from Squeeze.com. As someone who's always on the lookout for healthy ways to enhance my daily life, I must say this juice cleanse has been nothing short of rejuvenating. While drinking the juices provided by Squeeze.com, I felt less bloated and had a noticeable increase in my energy levels throughout the day. This cleanse has been a game changer. Juice cleanses can range from one day cleanse to a seven day cleanse. Each bottle is labeled with a number of one to five. The number corresponds to the order to drink your juice. It's super easy. You also get a bottle of cashew milk to provide the body with protein, amino acids, and just the right amount of added substance to ease into the cleanse while keeping your cravings minimal. You will also get free and fast delivery with our promo code. Head to squeeze.com and enter the code SUNDAY for free same-day local delivery or fast free delivery nationwide. The podcast Bible in a Year with Jack Graham is a moving and inspiring audio experience that will help you master biblical wisdom. In each episode, you'll reignite your love for scripture while learning to apply foundational truths to everyday life. 
This podcast was created to help you solidify your faith as you experience the story of the Bible through live action recordings and emotional orchestral music. Each cinematic episode is a journey through the Bible's most profound stories that will strengthen your appreciation of the Word and inspire you to keep learning. This is Pray.com's Bible in a Year with me, Pastor Jack Graham. Let's begin. Listen to Pray.com's Bible in a Year with Jack Graham on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcast, or wherever you get your podcast. Hello, I'm Bishop T.D. Jakes, and I want to welcome you to my new podcast with Pray.com called Sleep Songs. Close your eyes and focus on God. Picture Him as your shepherd that knows you and surrender to Him. Each episode guides you on a serene exploration of psalms, tranquilly calming every nerve and restless, mind-turning adventure that keeps you up in the middle of the night, transposing you into the safety of his arms. He is going to lay you down in green pastures and restore your soul. Join me and let the Lord be your shepherd tonight. Listen to Sleep Songs with Bishop T.D. Jakes on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcast. Have you found your place in Joshua yet? Some of you are just going to look at the screen. That's cheating. And what did we do before we had screens and phones? You actually had to open your Bible. You know, remember back in the day when when the when the pastor would say, "Turn to Ezekiel," you were like, "Oh no, where is that in the Bible?" Right? And so Joshua chapter number three, beginning in verse five, I'm going to skip around a little bit. The scripture says, "And Joshua said to the people, sanctify yourself, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you." Jumping down to verse fourteen. So it was. When the people set out from their camp to cross over the Jordan with the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people and all those who bore the Ark came to the Jordan and the feet of the priest who bore the Ark dipped in the edge of the water for the Jordan overflows all its banks during the whole time of harvest that the waters which came down from upstream stood still and rose in a heap very far away at Adam, the city that is beside Zaratan. So the waters that went down into the Sea of Araba, the sea salt fell and were cut off, and the people crossed over opposite Jericho. And the priest who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan, and all Israel crossed over on dry ground until all the people had crossed completely over the Jordan. Chapter number four, verse number one. And it came to pass, when all the people had completely crossed over the Jordan, that the Lord spoke to Joshua, saying, Take for yourself twelve men from the people, one man from every tribe, and command them, saying, Take for yourself twelve stones from here, out of the midst of the Jordan, from the place where the priest's feet stood firm. You shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place where you lodge tonight. Then Joshua called the 12 men whom he had appointed from the children of Israel, one man from every tribe. And Joshua said to them, cross over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan, and each one of you shall take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of tribes of the children of Israel that this may be a sign among you that when your children ask in the time to come saying what do these stones mean that you shall answer them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it crossed over the Jordan the waters of the Jordan were cut off and these stones shall be for a memorial to the children of Israel forever. Today in our series, Mental Health Goals, I want to minister to you on the subject, get some stones. Get some stones. Look at your neighbor and tell them, say, get some stones. Look at your other neighbor and say, get 
some, I, I can see what's happening in y'all's eyes right now. I could, I could feel what you're saying right now. Get some stones. Amen. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, right now we minister by your grace and by the power of your Holy Spirit. Thank you for touching every heart. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. You may be seated, by the way. Well, for the last few weeks, we've been talking about how to renew our mind because we have learned that our life follows our mind. And if we want a new life, then we have to have a renewed mind. God has created us in his sovereignty for our mind to inform our brains and our brains to issue instructions to our body on what to do and how to act. Now, some of you may have caught that your mind is not your brain. Your mind informs your brain. Literally, your mind is the thinking part of you, but your brain is actually the wired part of you. Your mind thinks, it instructs your brain, and your brain then instructs the rest of your body. And the way we think, our mind actually shapes our brain. This is called neuroplasticity, and we went to great lengths in this series to talk about how that all works But namely, our mindsets influence the neural pathways in our brain. Those are the instruction runs in our brain, the grooves. And and they predominantly influence those neural pathways, predominantly influence the behavior cycles that we experience in life. Unhealthy mindsets lead to unhealthy life cycles, which are less than what God has created us to experience in this life. Healthy mindsets lead to godly lifestyles, which, or life cycles, and that's the life that God has designed for us to live. Said succinctly, if we renew our mind to think in line with God's word and God's ways, we will experience God's good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. God's will is not three wills. God doesn't have three wills for your life. He has one will for your life. It's good, it's acceptable, and it's perfect. Amen? And so when we renew our mind, we experience that life that God has designed for us. And this is why Romans chapter 12, verse number 2, you remember, says, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. God has not only told us that we need to renew our mind, but then he's instructed us on how to renew our mind. And he's given us three mind-renewing mighty weapons so that we can pull down the strongholds or the um, unsound mindsets that are imprisoning our life. And the three weapons that he's given us are meditation, what we see or focus on, confession, what we say, and action what we do. And it is in the synchronicity of these three weapons where our mind becomes renewed and our life becomes transformed. And this is why if you read back to the opening verses of the book of Joshua, in Joshua chapter chapter number one, verse number eight, God tells Joshua to use all three. He says, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. That's the mighty renewing weapon of confession. But you shall meditate on it day and night. That is the mighty renewing weapon of meditation. That you may observe to do. That is the mighty renewing weapon of action according to all that is written therein. For then you will make your way successful. And then you will have good, make your way prosperous. And then you will have good success. So who is responsible for the success And the prosperity that we experience now, it's not God, it's us. And the reason why is because God is the same always. Yesterday, today, and forever, God is no respecter of persons. If God was responsible for success in our lives, then he would love some people more than other people. Isn't that true? Isn't that true? Let me say it again. Isn't that true? Right? So God has told us that he wants to do equally good for every single one of us, but we have a part to play in experiencing the life that God has designed for us, and that part that we have to play is the renewal of our mind through meditation, confession, and action. And when we put these three together, we get a renewed mind and a transformed life. And the way this mental trinity works together is synergetic. In other words, as you meditate on the right thing, 
think or focus on the right thing, then it makes it easier to say the right thing. And when you meditate on the right thing and say the right thing, it is easier for you to do the right thing. And so there's a synergy in this trinity, just like there is a synergy in the trinity of God, right? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They work in sync with one another. They are three but the same. Just like there is a synergy in you who is a triune being. You're a spirit that lives in a body and possesses a soul. And when you move in all three realms, physical, spiritual, and mental, and you move in harmony, there is a synergy that happens happens in your life. But out of these three, the money is in the doing. The doing is the biggest part of the renewing. I mean, it's, 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 it's what we eventually get to as we meditate and confess, but the doing can either glue or unglue the right mindsets into your brain. Matter of fact, we use the little phrase, what we do is responsible for the glue. And you recall what Dr. Carolyn Leaf said. She, she's a professional on this, a, a neuropsychologist, a PhD. She said this, it's in the doing of active reach, what we actually practice, that results in the ungluing of the negative thoughts in your head and the reorganization of the new thoughts that are glued or rewired into your brain. And the thoughts that get the most glue are the ones that are the most used. And so the more that you do something, the more that it triggers your mindset to get embedded in you in alignment with your actions. And we talked a lot about that brain integrity and all that kind of stuff. The power is in what we do, which is why when we stand before God someday, God is not going to say, well thought. God is not going to say, well planned. God is not going to say, well intended. But what is God going to say? Well done, good and faithful servant. Why? Because the power is in what we do. What we do is how we release our faith, right? And so the scripture teaches us over and over again, matter of fact, it hollows for us over and over again, this principle that the power is in what we do, that what we do is responsible for the glue. James chapter 2, verse 20, but do you want to know, a foolish man, that faith or belief without action or corresponding action is dead. So you can destroy your beliefs by your actions. You can be believing, believing, believing in your head and in your heart, but then you can do something that is opposed to what you're believing in your head and your heart, and you can screw up what you're believing. Matter of fact, when you read the scripture in the original language, it literally says that faith without corresponding actions kills the outcome of your faith. So God has an intended outcome for your life, and if your actions don't align with the intended outcome, you destroy the intended outcome that God has planned for you. We must appropriate or propitiate the Word of God. I'm preaching real good already, and I'm just just reviewing So here's the question. In order for us to renew our mind and transform our lives, we've got to habitualize the right actions over and over again until they become automated in our life so that that action has the desired effect on our mind. How do we habitualize the right actions so our mind can be renewed, our life can be transformed? And that's where we came to Joshua chapter number three. And Joshua gives us this this key to habitualizing actions in the day he is about to lead the children of Israel from where they've wandered for 40 years, the wilderness, into where they had hoped they would go to, and that is the promised land. And we talked about how this story is a story not just of physical transition, but also of mental transition. It's a movement from a slavery mentality, from an Egyptian mentality, into a promised land mentality. Because the only way you will ever experience physical change is if you first experience mental change because where your mind goes, your life follows, which is why the Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And so here's what we find in Joshua chapter number three. Here's what he says. And Joshua says to the people, sanctify yourself for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. And so it's not said, but it's implied in the verse, sanctify yourself when? Today. 
Sanctify yourself now. Like when somebody gives a command, it doesn't mean wait on it. It doesn't mean push it off to the future. When somebody says do something, like when God says do something, he doesn't mean deliberate. He doesn't mean think about it. He doesn't mean pray about it. He means do it. He means get to doing it right now, right? So sanctify yourself today, for tomorrow God will do miracles among you. And the principle is the key to habitualizing habits in your life, doing the same good things over and over again, is to win the day. Not win the month, not win the year, not win the life, win the day. Too many people trying to win the year, but you got to win a day before you can win a year. you got to win a day before you can win a month. Each day is how we win. And when we win the day, we stack wins on top of wins on top of wins until the actions that we are doing with our life become habitualized and they begin to influence our mind. Winning the day is how we do it. Benjamin Franklin said this. He said, one today is worth two tomorrows. Whatever you don't do today, you are less likely to do tomorrow. We all talk about the sins of commission that can ruin our lives, but how about the sins of omission that can also ruin our lives? Right? We should do it. 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 We should do it before it becomes too late to actually do do it. Right? And so the scripture tells us this principle over and over again, the power of today. Hebrews chapter 3, verse number 7. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today if you will hear his voice, don't harden your heart. In other words, if God speaks to you, don't harden your heart. Don't rebu rebuke or rebuff God. Don't, don't push away. Don't push back on God. If you hear his voice, do it. By the way, whenever you try to reason when God gives you an instruction, you won't do it. Whenever, whenever you try to reason God giving you an instruction, you won't do it. You'll talk yourself out of it. So that's why he says, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. Margaret Thatcher said this. Look at the day when you are supremely satisfied at the end. It's not a day when you lounge around and do nothing. It's a day you had everything to do and you did it. What she's saying, win the day. What did Jesus say? Luke chapter 9, verse 62. No procrastination. No backward looks. You can't put God's kingdom off till tomorrow. Seize the day, winning the day, that's how we habitualize the habits that God wants us to practice in our life, which results in a renewed mind and a transformed life. And so last week, we began to talk about ways to have winning days. How do I develop winning days? How do I have good habits in my life? And I gave you three last week, and you can go and listen to the message and get those three. Today, I was going to give you three more, but when I got to putting it together, I only have time for one, okay? But this one is powerful. Everybody say, get some stones. Say it again. Say, get some stones. You thought I forgot about my title, but I didn't, right? Here's the, here's the principle I want to give to you today. This is how you develop good habits and have winning days. You use ritual reminders. What is a ritual reminder? It is a visual reminder that helps anchor you to a healthy habit. A visual reminder that helps anchor you to a healthy habit. The Jewish people used a mezuzah. As a ritual reminder. What's a mezuzah? It's in essence something that they hang on their door, doorpost that reminds them to speak scripture. So basically every time they go in and they go out, they see the mezuzah there and they're supposed to remember to speak the word of God over their house, over their family, over their kids. It is a visual reminder that anchors them to a healthy habit. Matter of fact, I believe that it was born out of Deuteronomy chapter 6. Listen to what it says. These are the words which I command you today that they shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. Can I just stop for a second? Why doesn't my child fo follow God? Not always the case, but did you teach the Scripture diligently to your children? You don't have to wonder why they're not following God if you don't teach it to them, right? Now, sometimes you could teach it to them. They could still walk away. That's the story of the, the prodigal son in the Bible. But how many of you know that that son came back? Because the promise of God, when you teach the Word of God to your children, is when they're old, they won't depart from it. So if they leave, they're coming back because the pull of the Word. The Word of God is alive and active. And even when you can't reach your kids, guess what can reach your kid? The Word of God that has been sown into their heart and the Holy Spirit that will keep drawing them back. Teach them to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house. 
when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and you sh- they shall be frontlets before your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. How do we put this into practice? How do we put ritual reminders? Put a scripture on the door, above the door. Get one of them little plaques or something like that. You know, where you, when you walk into your house, you, you see it right there. So that when you walk in, you see that scripture. You know, we have one that says, ask for me in my house, we will serve the Lord. Every time we walk in, that's right, ask for me in my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We're not going to serve the world. We're not going to go the way of the world. We're going to serve the Lord. We're not going to believe the morals of the world. We're going to stay with the Bible. We're not going to let the world define what's right and wrong. As for me in my house, we will serve the Lord. Put a promise up. Put a promise on your mirror in the bathroom. And when you wake up and you're brushing your teeth, stare at that promise. Put a promise in your car on the dashboard of your car. Put a promise on your cell phone. Put a promise on your computer. Use a visual reminder, right? A ritual reminder is a visual reminder that anchors you to a healthy habit. According to rabbinical tradition, David would hang a harp over his bed bay by the open window. And it functioned as an ancient alarm clock. When the north wind started to blow, the sound of the strings would wake him up and he would study the Torah to the breaking of dawn. That's why he wrote in Psalm 108, verse number 2, Awake, harp and lyre, I will awaken the dawn. Why do you write that? Because he had a ritual reminder in his life to remind and anchored him to the healthy habits that were going to transform his life and renew his mind. Maybe you should set your alarm clock so that when it goes off, it's a worship station. It's worship music. So the first thing you hear when you get up in the morning is praises to God. You get up out of bed and you start your day praising the Lord. These ritual reminders don't just help you at the beginning of the day. They help tame your Mr. Hyde all day long. Y'all know Christians, right? You know Christians don't act saved all the time. You know Christians starts off, they're going to love Jesus on a particular day. Then the day gets going, and Christians start acting funny. Matter of fact, if you catch a Christian maybe 2, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, you might not even know they're a Christian. After they've been to work the whole time, been, been in, been in uh, traffic the whole time, had a couple of bad situations happened, so on and so forth, you know. It always amazes me when I bump into people, you know, and, and I, like I bump into clerks at the store and stuff like that, and they got their head down and stuff like that, and being all nasty and everything like that. And all of a sudden they look up, oh, hey, pastor, how you doing? All, all of a sudden it just changed, just like on a heartbeat. Here's what we need. We need ritual reminders to keep the winds going, the momentum going for the whole day. Do you know that Daniel had three ritual reminders? You know what they were? three times of the day. He allowed the clock of the day to be a ritual reminder for him. He prayed at midnight, he prayed at daybreak, and he prayed at midday. Uh, Daniel chapter 6, verse number 10. Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, this is a decree, you can't pray to anybody other than the idol of the king. When he learned that the decree was published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. Oh, I could preach this. When the government put out something that was opposed to the word of God, guess what Daniel did? He did what the word of God said anyway. Oh, I wish I could preach this for a second right here. The church is soft. The church is soft. The government said you can't go to church. Who said? God said do not forsake the assembling of yourself together. Back in the early days when there were plagues outside, the church was full of sick people, infirm people. The saints were going on to the street and pulling people into the house of God because how many of you know there's power in the house of God? The church is soft. And Daniel, he said, no, no, sorry. I'm going to be respectful but you know what? I'm going to pray. And he did this when it was hard. When it was hard. Why? Because 
This is how he stayed triumphant during difficult times. We stay triumphant when we do and practice what the word of God has to say. We anchor uh, some type of ritual reminder to a holy habit, right? Or to a healthy habit. So one of the things that happened to me is, is, is I got COVID, right? Thank God, I believe God to heal me from COVID. And, and so when I got COVID, I got blood clots in my legs. And I took medicine and God healed the blood clots. Because God is the one who is behind healing, amen? No matter how he does it, just matters that he does it. And so one of the things they told me, they said, well, you know, you have to drink a lot of water, and you have to keep moving all the time. So you know what I did? I started anchoring through ritual reminders uh, certain things that were going to remind me to walk and drink water. So here's what I do. Every day at, t- at 12 o'clock, when the, alarm, when the clock hits 12, I get up, I walk. Y'all have been seeing me walk, and I just walk around the church and walk around the church and walk around the church. And you know what I do when I'm walking around the church? Either I have a staff meeting with somebody or I pray as I'm walking around the church. That's called habit stacking, by the way. So I walk, then when 5 o'clock comes around, guess what I do? Before I go home, I walk, and I walk, and I walk, and I walk. And that's after I get up at the crack of dawn every morning and get on that Peloton. And, or start doing a P90X or something like that. So three times a day, the alarm clock tells us my ritual reminder. You know how I drink water? Every time I got to pee on my way to the bathroom, I guzzle water. I'm going to pee anyway, right? And this is a good time to get some water in me. And so those are just ritual reminders, simple things that anchor to holy habits. Holy. What was Joshua's ritual reminder? He had two. Number one was the ark. The ark was a reminder that God's presence was with him and the children of Israel always. In the text, we find that the ark went before them that it stood in the middle of the Jordan River as they passed by, the priest stood with the ark, and then after everybody went by, it came after them. The ark was their ritual reminder of the presence of God, that God's presence was with them always, that he goes before them, that he stands beside them, and that he is behind them. I don't know who I'm talking to right now, but God wants you to know he goes before you to clear the way so that you can get to where he has destined for you to go. And then while you are transitioning, he stands right by your side, even in the hard times. And then after you made it through, he takes up the rear guard to make sure you don't go back to where he has delivered you from. He goes before you, he stands beside you, and he is behind you you. The ark was their ritual reminder. It's like the old the song that we sing. I know who goes before me. I know who stands beside. The God, of, the God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The ark, their ritual reminder so that they would not forget. And by the way, the ark was to them what the pillar of fire And the cloud of smoke was during the time of Moses. Do you remember during the time of Moses, God parted the Red Sea? But it had been a long time since they saw God move that way. And I'm going to even know sometimes we can forget when it's been a little while and we need things to remind us of what God has done in the past. And if you read the story, God does exactly the same thing in the passing or the parting of the Red Sea as he did, does in the parting of the Jordan River. First thing he does is he goes before them. As they were going through the wilderness to the Red Sea, there was either a cloud of smoke if it was uh, uh, daytime or a pillar of fire if it was nighttime that was always before them. And that was leading them. The presence of God was leading them. And then one day they came to the edge of the Red Sea and the Egyptians were bearing down. And it says all of a sudden the pillar of fire and the cloud of smoke disappeared. And they thought that's just like God. He leaves us at a moment of despair. Isn't it crazy that the enemy makes us think those thoughts? That when we can't see God, we think, well, he's left us at our moment of despair. If you read the scripture, it said God didn't leave. He just repositioned himself. He actually got behind them. Why? He was in between the oncoming Egyptian army and the Red Sea that was before them. Why? Because God didn't want the army to get him from the back. 
And then where was God in the middle? You remember how the water walls stood up on this side and stood up on that side? You know what that was? That was God in the water with them, holding up the walls. Why? God before them. God behind them. God beside them. The ark. It was their ritual reminder that God was with them every step of the way. By the way, Joshua told the people, Joshua chapter 3, verse number 3, when you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the Levitical priest carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Here's what he said. He said, when you see the ark move, when you see the ark move, when you see the visual reminder, do it. When you see the visual reminder, do it. Don't just let it blend in. Don't just forget about what it means. Practice what it is prompting you to do. Get to moving. When you see the visual reminder, do the action you're supposed to do. Stop and pray. Quote that scripture. Spend time worshiping him. Kiss your wife. Some of y'all need a visual reminder to kiss your spouse. I don't understand. People, people get married. They're married. All of a sudden, they don't even kiss anymore. They're dating, can't keep their hands off of one another. They get married, now it's all legal, and they don't want to have nothing to do with one another. That's backward, right? Get a visual reminder. Maybe it's your alarm clock. Hey, honey, it's, it's 9 o'clock on Saturday night. I don't care what it is. Get a visual reminder. Drink your water. Exercise. Whatever the ritual reminder reminds you to do, do it. When you see it, get to moving. By the way, it's worth noting that when the people did what the ritual reminder triggered them to do, God did what God promised. When they moved behind the ark, when they stepped out, God stepped in. Listen to me again. When they stepped out, God stepped in. When they stepped out, God stepped in. When they stepped out, God stepped in. Look at the verse, Joshua chapter 3, verse number 14. So it was, when the people set out from their camp to cross over the Jordan, with the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people, and as those who bore the ark came to Jordan, and their feet, the feet of the priests who bore the ark, dipped in the edge of the water, for the Jordan overflows its banks during the whole harvest season. The waters came down from upstream, and they stood still and rose in a heap very far away at Adam, the city that is beside Zaratan. So the waters that went down into the Sea of Arabia, the Salt Sea, failed and were cut off, and the people crossed over opposite Jordan. Notice what happened. When they stepped out, God stepped in, but God was very far away. When they stepped out, God stepped in, but God was very far away. At the city of Adam, 19 miles from where they were. How many of you know that when you step out, God steps in even if you don't see him moving at that particular moment in your life. Because even when you can't see him, he's working. He never stops, never stops working. And so even though it's out of sight, one thing you have to realize is that when you step out in faith, God acts immediately. You say, Pastor, you got scripture for that? Yeah, I got a lot of scripture for it. Daniel prayed. And fasted 21 days. The angel showed up. He said, I really needed this. Why did it take 21 days? Here's what the angel said. The angel said, the moment that you prayed, God dispatched me with your answer. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 20 and 1 days. Now, that's a whole sermon in and of itself, but here's what I want you to see. The moment Daniel prayed, the moment you stepped out, God steps in. Even when you cannot see God stepping in, when you step out, you can rest assured because you've tasted his goodness, and so you trust in his promise. When you step out, God steps in. But notice, God is upstream in the city of Adam. Now, this is powerful. Because Adam is a symbol of the ultimate time God stepped in. Adam is a symbol of the ultimate time God stepped in. Adam was created to live in the paradise of God. Adam was created to have unbroken fellowship with the Father. Adam was created to live forever. Adam was created to provide God with a family to love and care for. But Adam messed up. Adam sinned, and all sorts of messed up circumstances entered the world. 
Sin is responsible for the messed up circumstances in the world. Not God, but sin. How many of you believe God wants you to sin? Good. That's theologically correct. If God doesn't want you to sin, then God didn't want any of the consequences of sin to ever come on you. Right? But Adam sinned, and all the bad consequences came in, and it seemed like mankind was doomed. But what happened? God stepped in. When it looked like mankind was doomed, what did God do? He stepped in. The waters were shut off at the city of Adam. Why is he using the city of Adam? Because that is the ultimate example of when God stepped in. Matter of fact, 1 Corinthians 15 says, the first man, Adam, was a living being, but the last was a life-giving spirit. God stepped in. He stepped into the mess. He stepped into the trial. He stepped into the storm. He stepped into the sickness. He stepped into the setback. He stepped into the situation. He stepped in. When you step out, I I wish I had somebody who could help me tonight. When you step out, God steps in. When you step out, God steps in. And all your stepping out does is release what God has already planned to do. God is not reacting. God's like, oh, what am I going to do now? The Father's not calling Jesus and the Holy Spirit together. Can we have a little powwow and figure out how we're going to do this? Stepping out, all it does is release what God has already planned. How do I know this? Because the waters stopped upstream, 19 miles away, at a city called Adam. Adam is an example of when Jesus became or stepped into our situation. Well, when did that happen? Somebody said, well, it happened almost 2,000 years ago. You would be wrong. Jesus didn't step in 2,000 years ago. Jesus didn't even step in on the cross. The Bible says he was the lamb slain from before the foundation of the earth. See, we operate with time. And so it looks like to us that God is delayed in his response. God's responses are already lined up for you. God's plan for your life. God's purpose for your life. God's will for your life. God's goodness for your life. It's already there for the taking. That's why you make your way prosperous. That's why you have good success. Because when you step out, God doesn't just step in. But what God has has planned for you, all of a sudden begins to materialize in your life. Step out. Get to moving. When you see the ark going before you, move. When you see the ritual reminder, step out. But Joshua had another ritual reminder. It was, it was the stones. Notice what it says. Before They left the Jordan. And before the Jordan River closed back up, God told Joshua, he said, get you 12 men, one from every tribe of Israel, right? And he says, and tell them to go get a stone from under the feet where the priest stood. The priests were holding the ark. The power of God was responsible for the miracle. Go get a stone, not from anywhere. Go get a stone from the riverbank. Don't don't get a stone from the wilderness. Get a stone from right underneath the feet of the priests. Take a stone from the mist of the Jordan River. Joshua chapter 4, verse number 5. Carry over before the ark of the Lord your God into the mist of the Jordan River, and each one of you shall take a stone on your shoulder. Take something from under the feet of the priest that is heavy, A stone, put it on your shoulder, that's heavy enough to remind you of how hard it was when you were stuck in the middle of your situation so that you won't go back, so that you won't do what the enemy wants you to do and go back to where God has delivered you from. Take a ritual reminder that lets you know that being stuck in that mess was heavy. Why do you ever want to go back again? Stones are ritual reminders that prevent us from going back and that help us win the days that are ahead by staying on course. Jesus told the paralyzed man, remember the guy called him Matt, 
the paralyzed man. Why? Because he was carried on a mat by his four friends. I don't know his name, but I call him Matt. His friends carry him all that distance, rip up with the roof, lower him down to Jesus, right? Jesus eventually, first he says, your sins are forgiven. Everybody gets mad that he forgives sins. He says, so that you will know the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins because forgiving sins is a greater miracle than healing your body, although they're, they're connected on the cross. Although they're connected on the cross. Some people got some foolish theology. Well, it's not, every, not, will, not God's will for everybody to be healed, then it's not God's will for everybody to be saved. Why? They're connected on the cross. His body was broken. His blood was shed. He says, so that you may know that the Son of Man has power to forgive sins. I say unto you, rise, take up your mat, and walk. Now, if that was me, I would have said, rise and walk. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, rise, take up your mat, and walk. If I was mad, I would have looked at Jesus, and I don't have anything to do with that mat ever again. What you, Jesus, I'm leaving the mat right here. Jesus said, no, 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 no. You need a ritual reminder. Take this home with you. Put it on the wall in your house. Put it somewhere you, where you could see it so that every time the enemy tries to pull you away, every time your life tries to go in this direction, you look at that mat and you said, all my life until I met Jesus, I was lying on that mat. But when I met Jesus, he caused me to get up from that mat. That's my stone. That's my stone. You remember when David was on the run from Absalom? David was on the run. Absalom, his son, was trying to overthrow him. And David didn't know where to go. He, he didn't have no food. He didn't have no, no weaponry, right? He's on the run. He doesn't know where he's supposed to go. And he runs to Nob. Nob was where the house of God was, the temple of God. And when David had nowhere to run, guess where David ran? To the house of God. Nowadays, you've got to beg people to come out to church. Because COVID's more contagious here than it is out there. See, sometimes see, I'm really polite when I'm not preaching, but when I'm preaching, I'm not that polite. Because when I'm preaching, what happens is I start to begin to deal with stuff that the enemy has duped you into believing. You know what this pandemic has done? It's lured the church into a sleep. It's plucked people off. I don't need church. I need to come out to the house of God. You ain't reading your Bible. When David had nowhere else to go, he ran to Nob, to the house of God, where the priest was and where the showbread was. And when he got there to Abimelech, you know what he asked Abimelech? He said, I'm starving. Can I get something to eat? And you know what Abimelech did? He said, the only thing we got here is the showbread. You couldn't eat the showbread. That was only for the priest. But how many of you know when you go to the house of God, you get living bread. You get the bread of life that you need. And don't tell me you can understand it all by yourself. I know you got the Holy Ghost, but God has gifted certain people to give us things. that we, Some of y'all came and you never even heard the word knob. You don't even know what the showbread was. He came and said, I got to eat. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. And he said, well, there it is. Go ahead and eat. And David ate the forbidden bread in the house of God. Why? Because grace always triumphs over the law. Because it's the letter of the law that kills. But it is the spirit of the law that gives life. And he said, can I, can I get the bread? And he ate the bread. And then he said, I need a weapon. He said, and guess why I came here? He said, because I knew that the sword of Goliath was here. He said, he said, I need it, I need it, I need it, I need it, I need it. Look at this, 1 Samuel chapter 21, verse number 9. So the priest said, the sword of the Goliath, the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Elah, there it is. It's wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If, if you will take that, take it, for there is no other except that one here. That's the only weapon we got. He said, I got nothing else to help you defend yourself. Just that. And David said, look what David said. Oh, there's nothing like it. Oh, give that 
one to me. Why that sword when David was on the run? Why that sword when David was being hunted? Why that sword when David, when the odds were stacked against David? Because that sword was a reminder that if God be for him, who can be against him? That sword was a reminder that greater is he that was in David than he that is in the world. That sword was a reminder that if God is on your side, your enemy is your underdog. That sword was a reminder. Ain't no mountain high enough. Ain't no valley low enough. Ain't no seed wide enough. Ain't no giant big enough. That sword was a reminder that no matter how hard it gets, God can always cut off the head of your giant. That sword was a reminder to keep David doing what God had asked him to do because eventually where God wanted him to be, he'd get back to. That was his stone. It was his stone. And David, when David's faith was on the rocks, David said, let me get back to something that reminds me of what God does in the middle of challenging circumstances. The sword, the mat, the ark, the stones. You got any stones? You got stones around you to remind you to keep doing day in and day out what God has asked you to do so your mind can be renewed and your life transformed? Here are some of my stones. I don't know which ones I want to show you first. Let's go with this one. You can't see it, and I'm glad you can't. It's a picture of me and my wife at the Grand Canyon. I was fat as all get out right there. 262 pounds is squashed into my clothes. This is on my desk every day. You know why it's there? Every time I start getting fat... It happens to me a lot. I'm always beating down fat. I'm always beating it down. It reminds me, keep eating healthy. Get back on track. Get back on track. Why? You got to serve God long. I don't just want to be healthy because I look good, because I look good when I'm fat anyway. I want to be healthy so I could serve God with long life and give God everything I have. That's on my desk. This is on my desk. This is a picture of my wife and my, my daughter, Nicole, and my son, Joseph, when my kids were real young. It's not a picture of what they look like, like now. It's a picture of, of them years ago because no matter how old they get, they'll always be my babies. But you know why this is on my desk? To remind me that every decision I make affects them. That when I got married and when I became a father, I no longer made decisions only for me. I made decisions for them. And this reminds me every day when I look at it to make sure that I make God-honoring decisions with my life out of my passion and my love, not just for God, but for them. You know what this is? So I'm a, this is at home, my home office. This is a picture of Times Square. You know why I have this picture? To remind me, God called me to New York. I'm not in New York City because I wanted another gig. I'm not in New York City. We're not in New York City as a church because I did. I wanted to miss football games on Sunday because we have church at five o'clock on Sunday. That's not why I'm in New York City. I'm in there because God called me there. And you know what this does? It reminds me to keep on doing what God has called me to do in New York City and called us to do as a church until I see with that campus what God put in my mind. It's a reminder. It's a reminder. You know what this is? This is another one of my stones. It's the first CD that we ever did. It was called Miracle. You know what this reminds me of? Is that God brought songs out of one of the most turbulent times in my life. And these songs, even for a minute though, last album for a minute, it was number one on pre-orders on iTunes. For a minute, it was there. And as what God reminds me of every time I look at this. Keep on praising him. No matter how hard it gets, it's one of my stones that I have in my life. You know what this is? The book that came out of one of the most tur- turbulent times in my life. This book 
Reminds me that no matter how difficult it gets, God can always turn every situation around. This book reminds me that no matter how much the enemy steals from me, that he's going to eventually have to pay it back sevenfold. This book reminds me of the faithfulness of God. It's on my desk. You know what these things are? It's in my office. It's on my desk in my office. It's a shovel and a rock. Duh. The rock says, Jesus is the rock. The shovel says, groundbreaking shovel, opening day, 2004. This was the first shovel ever put in the ground on this property. It's a rock that came up when I dug into the dirt. You know what this tells me to do? It tells me keep on doing little things like they're big things. And God will do big things like they're little things. Every time I see this, I said, keep on, keep on. It, it doesn't matter. I know everybody likes to be grand. And I lo- know everybody likes to make a splash. But here's what every time I look at that, just keep on doing the little things like they're big things. Keep on serving God with everything I got. Did you notice? I don't care how many people show up for church. I'm going to preach. I don't care if you say amen. I don't care if you don't say amen. I don't care if you stare. I don't care if you shout. I don't care if you stand up. I don't care if you look at me like I got four heads. I ain't preaching for you. I'm doing little things like they're big things because I know that that is the impetus for God to do big things like they're little things. You got some stones? What are your stones? Ritual reminders that anchor you to healthy habits so that your mind can be renewed and your life transformed. Would you stand to your feet with me? I don't normally do this, but I'm going to tell you this. If I was you, I'd go back and listen to this two, three, two, three more times. I could feel the the glory on this message. Listen to what 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 6 says, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Jesus is a stone. Every time you hear Jesus, every time you see a cross, every time Easter comes around, every time Christmas comes around, Every time you say time, 2002, don't end it there. I said the year of our Lord, A.D., right? Every time you say time, every time you reference history, B.C., A.D., Jesus is your stone. What's it supposed to remind you of? That God loved the world so much. He loved you so much that he left heaven He was born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life. He died on a cruel cross, and he rose again and left an empty grave behind. He's a stone. He's a stone to remind you that you don't have to go to hell. He's a stone to remind you that eternal life was given for you, that he gave his life for you, that heaven was created for you. Jesus is your stone, the chief cornerstone. If you were to die this moment or this second, where are you going? Heaven or hell? I don't know, Pastor. If you don't know, you're going to hell. Let me say it again. If you don't know, that means you're going to hell. I had somebody get so mad at me because I told people they were going to go to hell if they didn't have Jesus. They were here for the first time. They was like, how could you tell people that? I said, I believe God's smarter than me. She said, what? I said, yeah, I believe God. I said, you came to church. Obviously, you have some reference for the Bible, right? She said, yeah. I said, you know, that's what the Bible says. She said, where did it say it? I showed her. So without Jesus, you're going to hell. If you don't know, you're going to hell. Because if you don't know, when Jesus comes into your life, guess what happens? You have an assurance in your heart, you know. Where are you going, heaven or hell? They never came back to church, by the way. That makes me sad. But what, what is my option? 
This is why a preacher doesn't never supposed to preach for what people want to hear. This is why a preacher, it shouldn't matter whether people like it, don't like it, we're entertained or not entertained, because we're preaching the Word of God. The Word of God ought to aggravate you sometimes. If you come to church, you never get aggra aggravated by anything that I say, then I'm going to pray God helps me to turn it up a little bit to aggravate you real bad. The Word of God. Where are you going? Heaven or hell? Do you know? With everybody just between them and the Lord right now. If you don't know, you're going to heaven. If you're watching on television, if you're watching online, you don't know whether you're going to heaven. God wants to save your soul right now. If that's you, just put your hands up in the air. We're going to pray right now. I don't know if I'm going to heaven, but today I'm going to make sure I'm going. Hold them up high. Don't be bashful in any way. Hallelujah. God bless you over here. That's awesome. Hallelujah. Is there anybody else? Pastor, I don't know if I'm going, but today I want to make sure I'm going. At home, watching online, hold both your hands up if that's you. We're going to pray this prayer. Say this out loud after me. Everybody praying. Heavenly Father, today I give you my life. I ask you to forgive me. I repent of my sins. And I make Jesus the Lord of my life. I'll never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, I want to welcome you to the family of God. The ushers are going to find you. They're going to give you a little book. Take a minute and just fill out that little card in that book. We want to help you. If you're online, there's a little button there. It says, I gave my life to Jesus. Poke it. Listen, come on back next week. We're going to finish this. We're going to keep going. Invite some friends out to church. Invite them to Miracle Weekend. Invite them to Easter. God wants to save people. God wants to touch people. God wants to heal people. He's a good God. Amen. We love you. We'll see you again real soon. The podcast, The Bible in a Year with Jack Graham, is a moving and inspiring biblical audio experience that will help you master wisdom from the world's greatest book. In each episode, you'll learn to apply biblical principles to everyday life. Each cinematic episode is a journey through the Bible's most profound stories that will strengthen your appreciation of the Word and inspire you to keep learning. Listen to The Bible in a Year with Jack Graham on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you get your podcasts. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. It's a simple truth. No matter who you are, mental health challenges can affect you, and how you manage them can make all the difference. That's why everyone should have access to mental health support that meets them where they are and helps them get through. BetterHelp provides online therapy on your schedule. It's flexible, simple to use, and more affordable than in-person therapy. Connect with a licensed therapist selected just for you. Learn more at BetterHelp.com. That's BetterHelp.com. Com. Hello, this is Matt Potter from Pray.com, and I want to tell you about this new juice cleanse I've tried from Squeeze.com. As someone who's always on the lookout for healthy ways to enhance my daily life, I must say this juice cleanse has been nothing short of rejuvenating. While drinking the juices provided by Squeeze.com, I felt less bloated and had a noticeable increase in my energy levels throughout the day. This cleanse has been a game changer. Head to squeeze.com and enter the code SUNDAY for free same-day local delivery or fast free delivery nationwide. The podcast Bible in a Year with Jack Graham is a moving and inspiring audio experience that will help you master biblical wisdom. In each episode, you'll reignite your love for scripture while learning to apply foundational truths to everyday life. This podcast was created to help you solidify your faith as you experience the story of the Bible through live action recordings and emotional orchestral music. Listen to Pray.com's Bible in a Year with Jack Graham on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.